white Baha'is, Persian Baha'is, Chinese Baha'i, Indian Baha'is, rich Baha'is, in between Baha'is, jerk pole Baha'is, you name it, we got them. The Baha'i faith claims to be the fastest growing new religion in the world, with over three million followers. 120 years ago, a prophet appeared in Persia and proclaimed a new religion with a vision, world unity, under one all-embracing faith, and a promise of peace, God's kingdom on earth. The implications are enormous in 15 years, in the lifetime of most of us living today. The messenger of God says that at the cost, whatever the degree of suffering necessary, war will have ceased. Today, it is only the message of suffering that the world hears. In Iran, the land of its birth, the Baha persecuted. smuggled out of Iran, show the bodies of Baha'is immediately after execution. Painted on one leg are the words, enemy of Islam. At least 200 Baha'is have been killed since the revolution. The leaders are special targets. All but one of these Baha'i assembly members have been executed. Fatola Ferdowsi died in 1981. His son, Farhan. They died for the cause which they believe on, and we, I believe on, and all the Baha'is believe on. So, uh, at least I'm happy that, uh, you know, my father was not dying for something, uh, you know, ridiculous. He died for something which he believes and we believe. Women, even young girls, have died for their beliefs. Mona was 16. Mark, 51A, take one. This year, Canadian Baha'is publicized her martyrdom in a unique project. A hit music video, Mona and the Children, dramatizes the persecution in Iran. It's all part of a larger campaign to bring international pressure on the Iranian government. New York. The United Nations have been the focal point of increasing reports of the Iranian persecutions. The Baha'is have set up their own office as non-governmental members of the UN. The most pressing issue is monitoring and publicizing events in Iran. Their human rights representative is Gerald Knight. We believe that the intention of the authorities is to basically eliminate all traces of the Baha'i faith in the land of its birth. That may or may not mean uh, killing all of them. Probably and hopefully it doesn't mean that, largely because of the international pressure that's been brought to bear. Since then we have seen reports of the execution of a further six Baha'i leaders. We would urge the Iranian authorities to repeat citizens can enjoy their human rights and in particular the inherent right to life and the right to freedom of thought conscience and religion. Mr. Chairman, the fundamental question arises... The Iranian government why. insists the Baha'is are not persecuted West for religion, but as spies and traitors. ...pursue the so-called Baha'i issue against the popular, our popular government. No one is spied for the mere possession of a certain sets of belief. 
except those who actually engage in acts of espionage and other activities contrary to the high interests of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The UN Commission on Human Rights have repeatedly rejected this explanation and condemned the persecution of Baha'is in Iran as religious. But what is the religious issue? Well, it's very simple because of Islam as understood by the fanatics who are in power in Iran is that Baha'is, uh, according to their own interpretation of Sharia law, are apostates who deserve to be killed. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that they would go ahead and kill all the Baha'is. They would prefer that, having made an example of the leadership, that the rest would be intimidated into denying their faith or ceasing to practice their faith. And thus, the, the faith would basically die out. That is their intention. And this is because of theological differences. They believe that Muhammad was the last of the prophets. We believe that Baha'u'llah, Baha the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, was the latest, but not the last, of God's messengers who came to guide mankind. That's the difference. If theological differences lie behind today's persecutions, how exactly did they arise? The Baha'i faith first appeared in Persia over a hundred years ago. At the time, many Persian Muslims awaited a promised one who would appear to purify the faith. In the 1840s, a young Persian merchant calling himself the Bab announced that he was the promised one with a radical new message. The authorities saw him as a threat, and the Bab was arrested and shot. But the Bab had said that he was the herald of a greater one yet to come. In a Persian prison, one of his followers, Baha'u'llah, had a vision that he was the new messenger of God. He said he was the promised one of all religions, the second coming of Christ, the Jewish Lord of hosts, the Mahdi, awaited by the Muslims. that all the great religions of the world are true, and he, as the latest prophet from God, had a new message, peace and unity under one faith, the Baha'i faith. As Baha'u'llah's message spread, the authorities exiled him further and further away from Persia. He and his family were shunted around the Ottoman Empire, arriving finally in 1868 at the prison city of Acre on the west coast of Palestine. Here in this prison cell, Baha'u'llah developed the principles of his new Baha'i religion, teachings which he said would transform mankind. Racial equality, the abolished poverty, the creation of a universal language, and for the future, a Baha'i world government under one God. He left behind 100 volumes of spiritual teachings and appointed his son, Abdul Baha, to lead the faith. Pilgrims from the West were attracted to gentle, mystical religion. In 1911, Abdul Baha took a crucial step. He decided to take the faith to the West. Abdul Baha was just the man for the job. He was charismatic, approachable, he simplified his father's teachings, and he emphasized principles attractive to liberal Westerners. Equality for women, no racial discrimination, education for all, and an end to war. He spoke of a unified system of belief and government for the whole world, the Baha'i system. Abdul Baha came to Montreal. He stayed in our house. In 1910, 1911, and 12, his voyages to the West. And um, I saw him when I was a baby, but I don't remember it, unfortunately. And this was a lifelong connection. Then I came here in 1923, and I met this young man who was a successor of his grandfather, Shoghi Effendi. And of course, to me, he was the head of my faith. And when I came here for my third pilgrimage, if you like, in 19. 37, he um, told me he was going to marry me. I could have said no, but I didn't want to. <laughs> the young Canadian girl became the wife of Shoghi Effendi, who was just 24 when he became guardian of the faith and led the Baha'i into the 20th century.
Uh, he was an organizer, and quite a brilliant organizer, and he saw the necessity for religion in the modern age to be well administered, to be well organized. Under his guidance, Baha'ism spread rapidly from its beginnings as an offshoot of Islam throughout the world, first to the West, then to the Third World. It is not a world religion like Christianity or Islam in the sense of having a great history or a civilization or a culture or a developed theology or all of those things that we associate with a world religion. But it is potentially a world religion in terms of its um, growth, its membership and its spread. Chicago, Illinois, an extraordinary landmark looms over the suburbs of Wilmette. An architectural hybrid, part Taj Mahal and part Gothic Cathedral. Carefully designed by its French-Canadian architect Louis Bourgeois for peace of mind. Nearby, the Baha'i U.S. National Center. Their offices in Chicago control a network of Baha'i groups and activities across the country, setting up conferences and teaching programs, printing and distributing literature, enrolling new members. They've commandeered today's technology to serve their vision of the future. Well, according to the Baha'i writings, um, eventually America is destined to become the spiritual leader of mankind. And this doesn't mean the material. So this is a whole new world for, as far as we, we are concerned, for uh, Americans. For the American Baha'is, this new world in which there'll be spiritual leaders is a dream. But in Haifa, Israel, it's already under construction. himself chose Mount Carmel as the site for the center of his faith. This is the world headquarters of the Baha'i faith. It's the Baha'i world center, which encompasses both the administrative and the spiritual center of the Baha'i religion, the Baha'i world community. The Baha'is believe the world is on the verge of collapse. But as mankind teeters on the edge, the Baha'is, with their models of communities and world government, will come to the rescue. Computers installed in the basement of the House of Justice will soon be capable of instant communication with Baha'i centers around the globe. They need as many members as they can get. Recruitment is a priority. Membership in India alone has risen from 900 to almost a million in 20 years. In Hemingway, South Carolina, recruitment takes a more subtle form with an easy blend of popular music and public service messages. United World, one heart at a time. Radio Baha'i, WLGI. Radio Baha'i in South Carolina was put here because this is where the largest concentration of Baha'is is in the United States. There are more than 10,000 Baha'is within the greater broadcast region of the radio station. Uniting the world one heart at a time. This is Radio Baha'i, WLGI. We very much intend to, to share the Baha'i message over the radio. Um, but the Baha'i message is several, you know, can be communicated in many different ways. Dr. Roy Jones is a happy man. This former black activist of the 60s has just taken over the Lewis Gregory Institute, set up 15 years ago as a teaching center to spread the Baha'i message among the local population. Dr. Jones claims 1,700 converts in the last two months and plans for another 20,000 by next year. We have experienced back in between 65 and 70 a growth pattern that was phenomenal in which the Baha'i faith seemed to have appealed to the, to the rural, you know, southern black um, population. And now in 85, we're experiencing a, a great growth in the adherence of the Baha'i faith. So again, the message is, is reaching the population. 
it's a message that touches hearts, you know, and, and people in South Carolina are very, they're are heartfelt people. They're, they're folksy people, you know, they're friendly people. And the message penetrates hearts. I do believe. Old time gospel tunes, but new time Baha'i words provide the message. I now believe that the bomb died for me and with the To me, being a Baha'i is the most beautiful thing I've ever, I, I have never even dreamed this could happen. I have a more clear understanding about Jesus Christ, about all the prophets of God, whereas before I only just tuned in on Jesus Christ. That's all I know about. But now I know more about the others. Mary and many others are enthused about a religion that claims to welcome different styles, cultures, and existing faiths. I was a Methodist. I was a Baptist too. I feel that the time is right because everybody is searching for something and everybody is looking for something. And I think the Baha'i faith is what it is what it's looking for because they didn't try everything else. And it hasn't worked. People have been sitting back and they've been waiting. They've been, they've been going to churches. Um, they were going to conventions, looking for this spiritual uh, revival, and they haven't found it. And in the Baha'i faith, they found it. We have not purposefully uh, attempted to, um, to convert, using your term, uh, members of church congregations with the intent of upsetting those congregations. <laughs> I've lived in, in different parts of the United States, the Northeast, um, the Midwest, the South. Uh, I think uh, the message here is, is certainly given more directly. You've got a, a kind of an army uh, mobilized with unity of thought, unity of purpose, um, unity of action. It has an effect. The Baha'is, who clergy and no churches, are encouraged to go out and teach their faith. Well, I've been doing what we call mass teaching for about 15 years. I go, this is mass teaching. The people who live in this state, in this part of the state, have no other access to finding out about this faith. So it, it, it simply means that that the Baha'is have to make a special effort, have to give these people a special measure of love to go out and walk the world and to be home. That's the of God that we may wait that come. Hello. I want to show you is that Baha'is live all over the world. God sent different prophets down to mankind to teach him how to live better. He sent Abraham. It is a very direct approach. We believe that people are open to the message here in a way that they're not in other places. So that when you mention, you know, the Baha'i faith, that there's a natural curiosity for people who want to know more. So once you mention it, you know, people ask us the questions. Okay. Well, by by saying this, you're a Baha'i in your heart, and for us to better communicate with each other, we have this declaration card that you can sign. But before doing this, I have to read the bottom statement for you, and if you agree with that, then you can go ahead and sign it. 
And by doing this, we'll send you free information on Baha'i faith. We'll just help us communicate with one another. I have a study okay. with that. Mm -hmm. I have okay. A study about that. Okay. The Baha'i faith forbids alcohol, gambling, and involvement in politics. Its this teachings are infallible. In signing this card, I declare belief in Baha'u'llah, the God. I like Bob, his forerunner, the man like John the Baptist who foretold of Baha'u'llah, and abdul Baha, the center of his covenant, his son who kept the Baha'i faith united into one religion. I request enrollment in the Baha'i community with the understanding that Baha'u'llah has established sacred principles, laws, and institutions which I must obey. We're supposed to pray every day and try Baha'u'llah. Okay, can What's I... Let's get your name and address. We'd like to get and your name and address. You know, I ain't gonna join them. I ain't gonna join. I stay at... I can study over them. I study over that. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I ain't gonna find nothing to know. He didn't find. And so apparently people in the area. It looks suspiciously like a hard sell. Hard sell? Yeah. Well, if the product is, is one that we believe that um, uh, can, can contribute to... Uh, the betterment of, of the community, the betterment of mankind, and uh, uh, we certainly have problems uh, sharing about it. It just seems to happen here differently, and so the approach here is different. The style is different. The culture is different. The Universal House of Justice has absolute authority on the faith. It has an emerging world religion as it meets with different styles and cultures. But there are central tenets of the faith that cannot be adapted. Here is the Baha'i version of their teaching. It is another article of the Baha'i faith. The religions are the different stages of the same faith of God. Aggressively proclaimed locators of humanity, Moses, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, and now the Bab and Baha'u'llah. What it means in effect, when you say the oneness of religion, what I mean is that all religions are one and there are some that is the only one true religion. The Christian who becomes a Baha'i learns to love and respect Muhammad. I'm sorry to say not that we see from his followers today, but what we see in his life, in his study, and in his book, the poem, is a very wonderful book. The Jew accepts Jesus. The whole mantle of so to speak, have to accept the fact that Krishna brought a divine illumination to the world. The Buddha brought a divine message to the world, you see. It's a, it's a, it's a far broader concept than people realize. Another fundamental article of the religion is the prophecy of world peace. Baha'is are convinced that it's coming soon, ending suffering created by war. It looks as if we were so pig-headed, so stupid, so selfish, so asleep at the switch, that the only way we are going to get rid of war and go forward into the future and create a world civilization and abolish war is by being pretty well beat up somewhere along the line, you see. Then we will have to do it. And then that then comes the glorious future because you get rid of war once and for all. After the world is at peace, Baha'is believe there will be an inevitable move towards the creation of a new kind of government, a new world order. A world federal system will rule the entire planet and exercise unchallengeable authority. A world executive, backed by an international force, will carry out the decisions arrived at and will protect the organic unity of the whole commonwealth. A world tribunal will adjudicate and deliver its compulsory and final verdict in all and any disputes that may arise between the various elements constituting this universal system. This is the ultimate goal of the Baha'is, is to create a one religion, one state, one order system for the future. It's to be known as the Baha'i World Commonwealth or the Baha'i critic order Dennis McEwen. The and they are entirely serious in their intention to create uh, what would effectively be a world superstate, a totalitarian superstate, uh, which would be a one-party system uh, within which there would be very little room, I would think, for uh, serious dissent and um, divergence from that uh, system.
All right, you're an atheist, you are a, a hippie, or whatever you want to be, why not? You're free. Can't coerce people. You can entice them, you can educate them, you can uh, reason with them, but we don't believe in bludgeoning people to believe the way we do. That would be the exact antithesis of creating unity in the world, wouldn't it? The vision of a unified civilization without war is eagerly awaited by three million Baha'is throughout the world. The present day reality is that hundreds of thousands risk their lives for merely practicing their faith. It looks as though, unfortunately, we are moving now into another uh, phase of the persecution. Executions have started again after being frightened off, I guess, by the publicity and the attention of, at the Human Rights Commission. And it looks like we're into another dark patch in the immediate future, I'm afraid.